one, two, three. Yes, Pavan, I'm going to hand the mic to you, Makran. We're just trying to figure out where to place the screen where he can see you when he poses his questions to you, because right. the rest of us can see you very clearly on the screen. Right. Hello, Pavanji. Hi, Makran. We would have been very happy to see you in our midst and to have you here. It's a very special occasion. It's the 10th anniversary of this uh, festival, named after a remarkable individual, Mr. Kushwan Singh, who touched the lives of so many people. And uh, I think we should uh, acknowledge, of course, the, the founders and the moving spirits behind this festival, his son, Mr. Rahul Singh, and uh, Nilufar Ji, Nilufar Bharucha Ji, who, who are here somewhere. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you to start with, for any reminiscences of uh, Mr. Kushwan Singh that you'd like to share with our audience. And I might share one of mine after, after we hear from you. Well, there are so many. Can I move that? Please. Can you hear me now? I can't see him. There. Yeah, we can hear you, but I don't seem to be able to see you. So my back is turned to you, and I don't know what they're doing with the screen. I can't see you. Okay, but we'll we'll start the discussion anyhow. So please, if you have any memories you know, of Mr. Kushwan, I have so many memories. Share. I've I've written about them often. Only recently, my column in Hindustan Times, I acknowledged the fact that uh, my first book was probably published because of the generous intervention of uh, Kushwan Singh. I was an unknown author. I had written a 300-page manuscript on a biography of Mirza Ghalib. And uh, no publisher seemed to be keen. And there were very few at that time. This is 1988 or 89. I can't remember. And Kushwan Singh, uh, I went to see him. And I wrote about this in Hindustan Times just two weeks ago. And he was reading my manuscript to my great surprise. And I said, his son-in-law, Ravi Dayal, who was the editor of Oxford University Press, who also had my manuscript to see, had given it to his father-in-law to read. And he told me straight away, I like your book and I'm going to recommend it to Penguin, who are opening shop in India. And uh, he was very, very generous in his support. He did speak to David Davidar. And my first book came out and fortunately, got a good audience, so many more have followed. Even otherwise, he was a gracious host to a very exclusive salon. Uh, and uh, my wife and I were lucky to be invited more than once, uh, many times. In fact, the first time we went, uh, he asked Renu, my wife, uh, what would you like to drink? And she said, a glass of sherry. So he says, Dekho Renu. Ye mera ghar hai, diplomat ka ghar nahi hai. Scotch peeta hoon, scotch pilata hoon. Shayad beer ho, gin ho, rum ho. Sherry mein rakhta nahi hai. So, and that's how a relationship began. And his was the only house I knew which had a signboard outside, which said, please do not ring the bell if you are not expected. Uh, and uh, so, so he's come home. I've been there. And lastly, because this is, yeah, we have a limitation of time. The only man I know who wrote to me, even when I was ambassador abroad, on a postcard, and miraculously, it would reach me with a few lines scribbled on it. Fantastic. I mean, I want to share a little memory of my own. When I was invited to his house in Sujan Singh Park, I went with a leading Malaysian writer, K.S. Manian, who is no more, and uh, Dr. Kamala Chowdhury, about whom we heard yesterday from Malika Ji. And, uh, you know, the ritual over drinks followed. And he said to Dr. Chowdhury, he said, Kamala, I've been dying to have you pour me a drink, uh, especially because at one time you were such a beautiful woman, but you've evaded my clutches for so long. But today is your night. You have to pour me my scotch. 
So, uh, but you know, I, I just wanted to say we remember him for all these things. He was larger than life, but he was a very disciplined writer. He wrote every day. Uh, he was born with not a silver spoon, but a golden spoon in his mouth. But he really lived the life of a writer, highly disciplined. He encouraged writing. He influenced many, many people. He touched the lives of many. And uh, one of the most interesting things about him is he, is he also is that he always answered the phone himself, you know. Uh, so these are some of the things that we can celebrate about him. Uh, most of us here are writers or love writing, and uh, his impress and his influence lives on after him. So I'll come straight to the book now. This is the book we are going to discuss. The title of the session, I'm afraid I have nothing to do with, and I don't even know what it means. But the book we are going to discuss is called The Great Hindu Civilization, Achievement, Neglect, Bias, and the Way Forward. Now, I believe if you haven't read this book, you ought to read it because it's an important book. It also marks a very interesting, I wouldn't say turning point, but a very interesting milestone in Pavanji's own journey as a writer. We heard about his Ghalib book. He has a wonderful book on the Indian middle class, more than one, in fact, and his, uh, his famous uh, many other books on Krishna, uh, on Ramcharit Manas, and another wonderful book on the Shankaracharya. But the question that arises in everyone's mind is, is he kind of tilting uh, towards Hindutva? But I won't start with that question, Pavanji. The question I want to ask you actually is about, which will bring us to the heart of your book about the great Hindu civilization is the recent controversy over this film, uh, Ponyan Selvan One, directed by Mani Ratnam and based on a great novel by Kalki. The novel was written way back in the 1950s, 53, 54. It was serialized. It was a very long book. And many people tried to make a movie in Tamil, but they couldn't succeed. It was on Raja Raja Chola. And now Vetri Maran, this filmmaker, says, oh, Raja Raja Chola was not a Hindu king. It is a case of appropriation. So the argument is there was no Hindu civilization. You just made it up. What well, would you say a, to that? Uh, thank you, uh, Makaran. And I really want to say to Rahul and Nilufar and all my friends there that it's a great loss. I have not been able to come personally. The exigencies of my program at the last minute made it impossible. So the, the loss is entirely mine. Now to coming to your question. Uh, you know, the poser that is there a Hindu civilization cannot be seen in isolation. There are several questions asked, including is there such a word as Hindu? If so, is there a civilization associated with it? And even whether we can call Hinduism a identifiable religion or merely a collation of diversities. And there are other questions also which relate to the antiquity of Hinduism, Hindu civilization itself. I have tried to answer this by saying that it was indeed a remarkable period for the evolution of a civilization which unfortunately today is being used by two different ideologies and in the process of that being neglected or trivialized. What are these two ideologies? The left quote unquote, I don't want to say it because I'm one myself, but the so-called classification of the secular left liberal say that if you investigate the genuinely verifiable achievements of Hindu civilization, you are glorifying the past, which in a sense will be used by Hindu bigots today to further weaken or threaten the secular fabric. My answer to them is, that objectively researching some of the remarkable achievements of this period in philosophy, in society, in the arts, 
the invention of the theory of aesthetics in science, in political theory, in culture, these need to be investigated further because for a long time we were under this bias. And I must say, with, because I love him and I respect him, Jawaharlal Nehru actually propounded this theory that our entire past, we have to get over the dead wood of the past. He was modern in a Western defined sense, wanted to move ahead, wanted to break the shackles of the past. But in that process, he threw the entire baby out with the bathwater. And I'm saying for newly independent nations after two and a half centuries of colonization, you need to rediscover this past. Our educational curriculum does not. I wrote a 300 page, 400 page book on Adi Shankaracharya. Educated Indians living in Delhi, Hindus, I'm not saying, I'm not talking of religion, didn't know when he lived, didn't know what he wrote, didn't know the six systems of Hindu philosophy, didn't know what are the foundational texts of Hinduism. And I'm not talking of xenophobia or chauvinism. Basic knowledge. They didn't know much of the past because dwelling in the past, in a sense, and that too ancient India was tantamount to becoming a Sanghi. So, A, I wanted to demolish that. Secondly, there was another school of the ultra-right which sought to over-glorify the past and in the process trivialize it. This I call the Dinanath Bhatra school which said there are airplanes, there was television, uh, you know, there was plastic surgery, that there were uh, cars flying on the roads and all of this is documented. In fact, shockingly, what he has written are prescribed texts in BJP ruled states like Gujarat and Haryana. So on the one hand, by this kind of uh, uh, fantasy reinvention of the past, you are devaluing the genuine achievements of that past, about which I can give several lectures. And secondly, by being reflexively secularist, you are holding in suspicion any attempt to seriously evaluate that past. It is for this reason, Amartya, that I was attacked by both the left and the right. Let me recall to you a recent conversation I had at a function where I was sitting on stage with uh, the man who actually runs the RSS, Dattatreya Hosbele, the number two, an executive in charge. So Dattatreya ji turned to me and said, Pavan ji, maine aapki pustak great Hindu civilization akshara padhi hai. I have read your, and it's a 400 page book, I have read your book word by word. Then he mentioned the page. He said, up to page 300 and something. What you have written is, few could put forward our own point about the past and about Hinduism, about Hindu civilization better than you. But after that, you begin to criticize us for our excesses, for the lack of the very nature of Hinduism, which is tolerance, respect, inclusion and so on and so forth. So I want to have a discussion with you. I said with great pleasure because I am against both extremes, but I don't want a great civilization. And the first chapter itself uh, counters, is there, was there a word Hindu? I prove how it was from historical record. Was there a civilization? I prove that. Wendy Doniger writes, I mean, you know, I, I talk of these people with respect. Wendy Doniger says, dare I use the letter capital H to describe Hinduism? And she says, according to me, it is some kind of hybrid between an armadillo and a tortoise. And then when she got criticism for this kind of thing, and I'll tell you why she has this view also. When she got criticism, she wrote actually in defense saying, that I wrote a book of 799 pages on Hinduism, but I was blindsided by the fact that Hindus would read it. I mean, are we a bunch of people living in some jungle that we won't read a major book by a major endologist in America and interrogate it? So it is this kind of condescension that worries me. And what was Wendy Doniger's criticism? Because 
with great respect in an Abrahamic faith, whether it's Christianity or Islam. And I have studied these religions deeply and respect them. There, is, there are certain certitudes. There is a linear structure. There is a book. There is a church. There is a prescribed text. In, in Hinduism, the, if there is one unifying factor, it is that it is tolerant to diversities and only then seeks to assert what its underlying unity is. Now, this kind of religion, which is, uh, and I'll give you, I just mentioned six systems of Hindu, Hindu philosophy, which does not come to you as a fiat, but is always a dialogue. The Upanishads are a dialogue. The Gita is a dialogue. Even the Brahm Sutras, which are a third foundational text, always admit the point of view of the opponent to the thesis being presented and so on and so forth. Even the Charvaks, the materialist school, which says the Vedas are a bunch of lies are part of Hinduism. The esotericism of the Tantric school is part of Hinduism. So this causes in some people used to certain kind of faiths what Professor Rajiv Malhotra has called chaos anxiety. They don't have a linear structure. They don't have certitudes laid down. There are no Ten Commandments in Hinduism. But a very evolved theory of ethics. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. So what I'm trying to say is that this kind of criticism uh, uh, and the school which tends to devalue Hinduism, and by the way, with great respect, because he's a personal friend and I've read his books, Professor Amartya Sen, lays this down explicitly. He says, and by the way, there are few people more knowledgeable about Hindu civilization, about Sanskrit texts, about the research, the query, the prof profundity of thought, the loftiness of vision of some of our metaphysics, philosophy, uh, grammarians, and so on and so forth. And Amartya, Professor Sen says, no, no, let's not go there. Because if we do, it will lead to Hindu bigotry today. Now, which is wrong, but because of that, you cannot ignore the past also. I mean, to the extent that Professor Amartya Sen says, that the great grammarian Panini was not even Indian. He was Afghani. And he says that because in the 4th century BCE, since he was along the Kabul River, by current geographical territories of political states, that's in Afghanistan. But at that time, that part of India was very much a part of the empires in India. So, you know, or he said there, is, there was no Hindu period for a thousand years we were Buddhist. Now, the Buddhism and Hinduism, Buddhism is an offshoot of Hinduism, a great religion. So is Jainism. But there was so much overlap and commonality between them that to try and counterpose one against the other in order to say there was no Hindu religion or civilization or period. To my mind, doesn't make sense. So I'm sorry for this long reply. I wanted to put the book in context. And it's very highly researched. Exactly, exactly. It seems to me that uh, the term religion itself is inadequate because we have no word for religion in our Indian languages. If you said to somebody, you know, what is the Indian word for religion, say in Urdu, the word, you know, Iman shows up. And uh, even if you're a very anti-religious person, nobody wants to be called Beiman. Or the, the word for religion is dharma in many Indian languages. But nobody wants to say I'm a dharmic, even if they're an atheist. So it's a problem with categories. I mean, religions of profession or religions of the covenant, religions of the book, religions of single prophets, and religions of experience or transformation or yoga are not quite the same. And if you lump them all together, you get into this world, you know, epistemological bind, as it were. But, you know, you're bold to you start by saying the uh, whole move to cancel the word Hindu is not justified. And uh, of course, you don't mention it, but the word uh, Sapta Sindhu is very old. It comes in the Rig Veda itself. Then it becomes Hafta Hindu because the Sir becomes the Her. 
as you cross from the Indus and go go towards Iran, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the the uh, as it were, the fallacy that you just pointed out in Amartya Sen's argument is that Hindus didn't exist till before the colonial period, but Afghans existed. Ergo, you know, Panini is an Afghan, but there were no Hindus. But just mention very briefly, what would you say to Vetri Maran, who says that Rajaraja Chola, who built the great Brihadishwara temple, was not a Hindu? I say, if that is wishes, what, what he wishes to believe, although my knowledge says that he was a Shaivite king, and in any case, many Shaivite fol Shiva followers were also Vishnu followers. You know, there is this kind of interpermeability that Hinduism allows. That is why Hindu kings were patrons of Buddhist Viharas. Half the family went to one place, half the family went to another. I'm not saying there was never any friction, but by and large, religion was an inclusive uh, framework rather than by exclusion. That has been the conquering eclecticism of Hinduism. That is why for 5,000 years it has survived because it has deliberately eschewed brittleness. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and therefore, Therefore, to coming back to the film, if he says he was not a Hindu, we should have a smile, have a cup of coffee. But okay, okay, you are Hindu, R-E-V, Rev 1. No problem. Okay. What is the big deal? No, our uh, sages and sayers did not tell the Charvaks that you are not Hindu. Yeah, okay. You think the Vedas are lies, although we revere them? No problem. Yeah. In so fact, I'm we still. We talk about the Shada Darshanas, but if you see Madhavacharya's, you know, Sarva Dharma Samagraha, there are 54 traditions outlined. So it's actually a cornucopia, ever expanding. Anyhow, just to give a structure, idea of the structure of the book, there are six chapters and we'll have to skip. We can't, we don't have enough time. We lost a lot of time in the technical setting up of this session, unfortunately. But... Uh, so the opening chapter is Hindu civilization, myth or reality. We've talked at length about it. And then the second and third chapters actually are a very, I would say, useful and well-researched overview of the wonder that was India, to use the title of Ail Basham's book. And, uh, uh, and then you have this very interesting chapter, chapter four, the Islamic conquest, where again, I think that you've you've departed from the so-called whitewashing of that period and you you start by saying that i'm going to quote uh you start by saying that of course we don't want to write revenge histories but uh and you name names you've named amartya sen earlier then you've named irfan habib uh as father muhammad habib you re, you've named romila thapar and you said motivated apologists have, have other unconvincing theories one of these propounded by the late Professor Muhammad Habib of Aligarh Muslim University, sought to extenuate the extent of savagery by arguing it was motivated by the lust for plunder, which any conqueror would display. And this whole chapter is actually, in a way, a corrective to what one might call secular fundamentalism, denialism, negationism of what happened in the so-called medieval period. And you don't have to look far and wide. You go to any museum, you'll see every image is disfigured. Uh, and the, the destruction of that ancient civilization is well known. And of course, the Christians did it also. It's well documented in Catherine Nixie's book about how they destroyed the so-called pagan civilizations of Rome and Greece. And then the Islamic invaders did it. Wherever they went, they destroyed whatever was before, and some have lost their memory of that period altogether. Uh, but you've documented it at length. You've quoted uh, historians like Warder, Will Durant, Heinrich Zimmer, and so forth, uh, and uh, have actually talked about that, that period. So I'm going to ask you a question about it in a moment. But just to complete the overview, then you go to the British rule. And finally, the challenge of the modern republic. Now. How much time do we have? 10 minutes. So we're really out of time. We'll make but it 
questions. I think we should ask a couple of questions. But what I want to ask of you, just, just uh, uh, you know, in this historical overview, can you tell us where you think uh, these discussions, these debates, which are in a way, I call them India's uncivil war. You know, these are our cultural wars just now. And the war is actually between Hindus themselves with the other people looking on. It's really a fight for the soul of India, if you want to use that phrase. So what is the way ahead? You've already said you steer in, uh, you steer a middle course between two extremes, you know, of uh, a kind of uh, secular fundamentalism, if you will, and a, a kind of extreme Hindutva ideology. So for the, for the modern republic that is India today, with a very fraught, uh, you know, civil society, where the meaning of religion is is uh, is really debated so intensely, what is the way forward? Uh, okay. And then we we'll answer all your three questions. questions, please, please, and briefly, so that we have time for a few questions, if at all. Uh, I think you should give us ten minutes extra because we lost time in setting this up, you know, because it's not fair. Otherwise, people will say you sabotaged this session, you know, technologically <laughs> sabotaged. Okay, and go I'm ahead. Sure go ahead. Best and I am really to blame for not being there physically, but to come back quickly for shortage of time. My chapter on the impact of the coming of Islam has been interpreted to mean that I am, in a sense, denying my admiration for the Ganga Jamuni Tehzeeb of India, the syncretic culture of which is so dear to us, which has enriched us and which I am myself a product of and admire. Please try to understand what it is I'm seeking to do. You see, there was, and I'm simplifying it for this purpose, there was this kind of notion among some people, perhaps well-intentioned to end acrimony between different religions, that the Muslim invaders came in a kind of tourist bus. They carried some biryani for the people they conquered. Uh, we gave them here and receiving them some uh, puri alu. And we all sat down and built up this Ganga Jamuni Tezi. All I'm saying is, please don't brush aside history. Because you are only creating a backlash against that very goal which you admire, which is our Ganga Jamuni Tezi. The facts of the matter are, as the best as I could assert, that there was widespread, wide scale plunder, desecration of not only Hindu temples, but Hindu centers of learning. When Nalanda was burnt, the library was so rich, it burnt for almost a year thereafter. So there was destruction. An entire civilizational, the symbols of an entire religious civilization were under jeopardy. And it survived because Hinduism reinvented itself instead of being di directed from the sanctum sanctorum of temples or of kingly courts, it went to the people through the bhakti movement, went into the vernacular languages, reinvented itself, simplified itself, questioned orthodoxies and acquired a popular momentum which enabled it to survive. So we must face the truth of that. As far as the British conquest was concerned, I have always believed that the success of colonialism is not your physical subjugation. It is the colonization of the mind. And the British, by the way, were by far the most successful colonizers in this regard. Because, as put down famously in the minute of, uh, what's his name? Lord Macaulay, minute, Thomas Babington Thomas Macaulay. Macaulay. He said, we will create Indians, black in color, but like us. And to do this, you have to denigrate the civilization of the ruled in order to justify your validity in ruling them, to bring to them the benediction of Western civilization. And the amazing thing is the extent to which Indians themselves internalize this critique. And therefore, I feel that the need
to re-examine our past, not through xenophobia or chauvinism, but objectively. Because political freedom came on 15th August 1947. But the cultural, intellectual colonization takes much longer to go and we need to be careful about it. As far as the challenge of the new republic is concerned. First of all, it can be any government, including the BJP, which comes to power saying we have to resurrect our culture, whatever it means to it, and spends the least on culture, cuts its budget every year, has no vision on cultural revival, genuine cultural revival, except symbolisms which actually are not about revival, but division. Secondly, there is in the reassertion of Hinduism, and the backlash has verifiable reasons behind it. I, I, I've detailed them in my book. And please, I don't have the time to go into it. Whether it was the Shabano case, whether it was the tinkering with the Hindu personal law, whether it was Gandhiji's support of the Khilafat movement, whether it's the government control over Hindu shrines. There are various factors which have contributed to the Hindu backlash. What the BJP, in my view, has done, and the RSS, is to take advantage of that backlash, to convert it into a movement by which there is the consolidation of the Hindu vote against the other minorities. And that divide is perpetuated and reinforced for short-term political dividends. In my view, it's very clear. And, but the real danger is not that. All parties do that to some extent. The Congress probably used the Muslims as a vote back. The real danger today is that in this process, they have encouraged and empowered an extreme right-wing Hindu subclass of Lumpuns. If you take one of them, and I mean the Bajrang Dal, for instance, the RS. I, I say in my book what I had redeeming features except for the fact that you can never accept the impractical, outdated idea of Hindu Rasht. But it had its redeeming features. It helped in repatriation, resettlement of Hindus after partition. It played a key role during in support of the government and the army in 1962 in the war with China in 65. In fact, Panditji invited an RSS contingent in 1963 to march as part of the Republic Day on Rajpath. So, I, but this lumpen class, if you take any one of them, lock them in a room and say we will release you if you can write one page cogently on what is Hinduism. I guarantee to you 95% will fail. Now this is what we have to be afraid. They are no longer, I've just written a column for my, one of my columns on NDTV.com uh, is that the BJP and RSS are no longer in control of the forces that they have themselves unleashed the likes of Bajrang Dal or the Sri Ram Sena or to some extent the other affiliation of the Vishwu Hindu Parishad, which it has used for political power, but which are not in control anymore. The Bajrang Dal is the fastest growing organization in the sun. It has got used to the patronage of power with a BJP government at the center. And its leaders say, this swagger is something we like. This cause, whether we know what it is about or not, or what damage it does to real Hinduism, is something we can always talk about. So can, can we steer the conversation back to the people. book? Because, you know, we... This is what I've written in the last chapter. Exactly. I'm just saying we tend to get... We veer off into the political. It comes so easily no, no, to us. In the last chapter. the world of ideas. No, anyhow. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, come back to the book and just say that this middle portion of the subtitle, the bias, it's still to be properly corrected. You know, we're going to have a session on Akbar the Great uh, later on, maybe today or tomorrow. And often in these sessions, they don't talk about Akbar's campaign on Chittor, where 30,000 people were killed. And it's precisely these facts, when you really examine them, that we understand what actually happened in that period of history. But we'll take a couple of questions now. Thank you, Pavanji. Wonderful to talk to you as always. And uh, very, yes. very cogent. You didn't duck a single question. And uh, I think we'll have some more. 
My only request uh, to our interlocutors today is please ask a question. Don't give a little speech. We respect your ideas, but please frame a question. Only questions will be permitted. I'll start with the lady with the blue hair. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, so just going off of what you just said about how uh, where we stand today with sort of like radical um, uh, people calling themselves Hindus and the violent acts they commit being a sort of result of political uh, encouragement. I wanted to ask you if you think there's also maybe a sort of epistemological violence within the Gita and the Mahabharata, um, specifically when we talk about dharma and um, sometimes in the in the books you you read of how violence is prohibited but not in the name of the divine and so i wonder if that sort of like prohibitive violence allows for a, um, a sanctioned violence and therefore leaves room for an, uh, misinterpret not misinterpretation but interpretation yeah thank you wonderful question uh, we'll take a couple more and then forget. maybe yes please go ahead then we can uh, you know have the answers all together uh, good afternoon i heard um, um, somebody i i don't uh, respect very much say that uh, hinduism is dharma and everything else is a religion i don't even know what it means so if you could just throw some light on this Okay. Anybody else has any question? One more. Okay. We'll take only three for the time being. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I want to ask you, Bhavanji, uh, why and how did this crippling disease called caste system creep into Hinduism? Okay. Thank you. These are wonderful questions. And Bhavanji, would you yeah. like to... First of all, to the first question, violence. Of course, there is no civilization or religion associated with it where there is not in certain situations the sanction of violence. Whether in Hinduism violence is used for proselytization, I don't believe there is a sanction for it because Hinduism does not allow for conversion. Also, I do not have too many facts at my disposal to argue the point that Hindus extensively destroyed large parts of the empirical uh, nature of other civilizations. They were, by the way, the dominant intellectual cultural force in a large footprint of Southeast Asia. But it was not by conquest. So I am not. In fact, it's interesting and I am not justifying. Violence is wrong and Hindus can be very cruel also. You have to be a little cruel if you are lynching or someone and chanting Jai Shri Ram. But this is not what I believe was sanctioned. I mean, in Tulsi Das's Ram Charit Manas, Lakshman asked Ram, tell me, what is the highest virtue? And this is the re reply of Ram in the words of Kulsida. Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par pida sam nahi atmai. There is no greater dharma than non-violence and welfare of others. And no greater crime than causing injury to someone else. So I'm not saying every religion has this and every religion is violent. But I believe it's a question of degree. And certainly I want to say at the end, the violence that we are seeing by ultra extremist Hindu groups today has an illiterate lawlessness to it, which is a serious threat to the grandeur and profundity of thought of Hinduism itself. Those who wish to preserve Hinduism. Right. What about the caste question? Uh, caste question. I have talked of two major blemishes in the evolution of Hindu civilization. One is caste and the other is gender disparity. Now, as far as caste is concerned, I have a 
quite a few pages on it where I write that initially all latest scientific evidence, including DNA evidence, seems to point that for the first two millenniums or more of the evolution of Hinduism, this was not a watertight compartmentalization or a discriminatory hierarchy and there considered the norm inter marriages, inter dining, etc. But sometime later, say around the turn of this century, these began to be crystallized by certain dharma shastra of which the leading one is Manusmriti into iron caste subdivisions where the entire structure was based on the exploitation and oppression of the lowest rungs, including specifically the Dalits. And I have written that you talk so much of V.D. Savarkar. He is the biggest social reformer. If you cut out his polemic on Hindu Raj, he has written much more on the reform that Hinduism needs, which today any kind of such query or interrogation is considered targeting Hinduism and hurting religious sentiment. And that's what our great leaders have done from Vivekananda to Gandhiji to Jyotibai Pule and to so many others. This is a reform we need. On the third question of uh, Dharma and Hinduism, you see, essentially Dharma is seen as right conduct. But it is not apart from providing an ethical framework of what are the virtues, especially those which contribute to mental peace, which prevent agitation. Tell the truth, non-injury, non-violence, don't steal, etc. We don't have ten commandments. Exactly. We... Sorry. Sorry. No, we're almost out of time. And yes. the Madhur is waving to me saying, wind it up. We want to thank you. And I think this conversation is going to go on. I'm just going to say a couple of things. We had a wonderful session on Shorobindo yesterday. You've cited him in the book. And one of the participants quickly looked at the index and said, Chalo, pass kar diya. But... Uh, no, seriously, the questions of... I want to make one last point for 20 seconds. Yeah, I'll come back to you. I'm just saying that questions on dharma, spirituality, their relationship with Judaic, Judeo-Christian or religions of covenant, these questions are addressed wonderfully well by Sri And uh, I invite you all to look at them. And I also like how uh, Pavanji's mind is agile, fertile, keeps changing with times because in his earlier books, just to throw out an example, uh, he said, oh, the, but the Sufis were different. In this book, he says, most Sufi orders were very violent, which is a fact if you read the history. And he has the courage to say these things which are unpopular. And today he just said that uh, Hinduism is not proselytizing. I disagree. Vaishnavism, I don't like the word proselytizing, but it's an invitation. What was Chaitanya's movement? In a way, Sikhism, anybody can be a Sikh. The first sons of Hindus became Sikhs. So, and ISKCON is an example. These are things we should challenge. Hinduism is an, is an invitation. Anybody can join. It's not that, uh, but it's not proselytizing with sword or with, uh, you know. Uh, uh, okay, such, one last point. Yes, seconds. it's all yours and then we wind up. Please we'll go ahead. Thank seconds. you all very much. Thank you. I'm seconds. Sorry, we can't you take a cannot question. fight Hindu yeah. bigotry unless you are knowledgeable about what you need to do. Exactly, exactly. And this is what people need to understand. No, I'm so sorry, sir. We are out of time. Please respect the organizers. There's another session. But I want to uh, um, invite all of you to please give Mr. Pavan Varma a very big hand and uh, we wish him great success as an author. We are looking forward to your next book and whatever happens in the political sphere, whether you're successful or not, we really are very sure that you're a great writer, a great intellectual and uh, a very valuable asset to contemporary India. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul and Nilufa. Thank you, Makran. Thank you, Pavan.